today I'm here to talk to you about uh, improving normalization methods in uh, microbiome sequencing data. Um, so first, to get off the bat, like what is the microbiome? Well, the microbiome, uh, a microbiome is a community of microbes from a given environment. So that could be from an ocean, from a soil sample, or in relation to health from the human intestine. So we talk a lot in health about the human microbiome. And most of the bacteria in humans are in your gut, in the intestine. So there's some bigger with some guts there. And uh, if you look closer into the large intestine, this is what it looks like. So you have, uh, you have a few little cells that, that cook the outside layer of the intestine. Here's the inside layer. And then so on the top of this figure, that would be the inner intestine is, like the inside of the tube. And so where the bacteria are, are all covered over that entire inner surface. But another place where they are in the large intestine is there are these little gaps in the epithelial, which are called uh, colonic cr crypts, and the bacteria can kind of fit inside there too. Now this is kind of a bit more, obviously, like high-level cartoon bacteria, so to give you a better idea of what it, it actually looks like, the bacteria inside your intestine, there's this really cool uh, study that was done where they, they took five different types of bacteria, they uh, put different uh, fluorescent, fluorescent probes inside of them, and then they took those bacteria and they put them into germ-free mouse, and then they took a section of the large intestine and visualized it. And so this is what that looks like. And so this is like a very similar region that's shown in the black square box up top, where you have, uh, you can see here, this, this the epithelial layer, and then this divot that kind of comes in that's a clonic crypt. And those little dots that are all over the place up there, those are all the bacteria that are in the, large, in, in the inner large intestine. And you can even see some of the colored dots inside the crypt as well. So they're all over there. And so but the big question is, why do we care about the microbiome in, in humans? And the uh, first reason is because it's cool. But if that's not enough for you, then it's because there's big relevance in health. Because uh, gut bacteria have been found to be altered in a lot of different diseases. Some of them are uh, like more, more obvious diseases that have to do with diet and inflammation, like IBD, Crohn's, also colitis and diabetes. But even other disorders, like disorders of the brain, like depression and Parkinson's, also have altered gut bacterial communities compared to healthy patients. Controls. And so, in this talk, I'm talking more about uh, like how we analyze bacterial communities from these samples, these human microbiome samples. And so, how do you sample the bacteria that are in our intestines? Well, from as people are willing to give it away for free, and we can get these great bacterial profiles. And so, this is, and so, and and the way that you actually quantify bacteria in a sample is through uh, 16S marker gene sequencing. And so here's our original sample. We have a stool sample. And then this would be the four, a very simple example of four different types of bacteria that are in there. And then so within each of these bacteria, I've also put the, uh, the 16S uh, ribosomal RNA gene. And so to quantify the bacteria, we specifically uh, sequence this hypervariable region of the 16S gene. And so the first step is to extract the DNA. And each bacteria has a uh, different 16S gene with a different hypervariable region, which the hypervariable region is the color on the bar. Like, different species of bacteria have a different region. And so we extract the DNA, and there it is, it's a 16S DNA. And the next step is to sequence it, sequence the hypervariable region of the 16S DNA. And so what you're actually doing when you're sequencing is it's taking a random sample of uh, these 16S sequences, and then you're reading the hypervariable region. And so that's what you get, that's the output. And then the next step is to map your reads back to the original bacterial genomes to figure out which, to the original 16S genes to figure out where they came from. And so, and so you align them to the genomes. And then you have your reads, and now the next step is to count them. And these counts now give an approximation of the counts in the original sample. And specifically, the relative abundance profile, which is when you scale these counts so that everything sums to one, you get relative proportions, is very similar to the pr proportions in the original sample. And so the main thing to get out of this is like that thing, that, that the abundance profile that you get is very similar to the one in the original sample. And also that uh, your counts come from this random sampling from that original bacterial population. And then from those counts, you can get relative abundances which are similar to the original. So now, moving on is I'm going to be uh, 
focusing more on the data analysis side now. Once you already have these bacterial counts, these sequencing counts, and the relative abundance profiles, what do you do next in the data analysis step? And what you have to do is normalization. And I'm going to go through a little toy example to say why you need to do that. So here on the left, that's our true hypothetical bacterial population in these uh, two samples. Another simple data set with only four types of bacteria. And then on the right, that's our sequencing data set. So it's just a random sample of the original community. And then you can see that they don't look very similar at all. But as I explained before, the thing that is similar is when you scale your sequencing counts to relative abundances, that relative abundance profile of bacteria looks very similar to the relative abundance profile in your original sample. And so the problem with analyzing just relative abundances is that you would lead to spurious findings. So say if I'm looking at this, uh, the green taxon 4, which is shown on the bottom of the plot, uh, if I look at the relative abundances, it looks like it's gone down in sample 2, right? And so I might think, like, maybe that's a good probiotic. If that's a disease patient, I could give them that bacteria and they might get better. But if you look at the actual true abundances, they've, they had, both samples actually have the exact same number of bacteria. So that would be a spurious finding that comes from only analyzing relative abundance data. And it's for that reason that we need to normalize. And what normalizing is, is it's going from the sequencing data to some approximation of the absolute counts in the original, pub, uh, the original samples. And so uh, all current normalization methods, they have two statistical assumptions. One is that you have uh, most of your components, which components are just the parts of the whole that you have sequenced. They would be genes or bacterial taxa, depending on what you're quantifying. So most of your taxa have to be random across your samples. And then also there's a balanced differential abundance assumption, which means if you have a bunch of bacterial taxa that go up in one set of samples, there has to be an equal amount of bacterial taxa that, whose abundances go down in, in that same set of samples. And so they have these two assumptions, and the methods that have these two assumptions include DC2, EDGAR, ANCOM, ADELX2, all these different differential expression analysis tools. So the problem is that these assumptions are very likely to be violated in a lot of data sets, and especially in microbiome data sets. And even a, a study, a simulation study by, uh, by Wise et al. in 2017 uh, found that, that, in fact, when these assumptions are violated, false discovery rates go up when you're trying to detect differentially abundant bacteria. And so the way that, that, and the solution that I've come up to to kind of solve this problem is to develop an algorithm that does not have these two assumptions. And so that algorithm works like this. The first step is you find which bacterial taxa are randomly distributed across all your samples, and then you normalize using DC2's method only on that set of random taxa. And so that's how it works. And I'm just going to be going through now a more detailed explanation of the algorithm. So I've called this method random component medium normalization. And so the first step is to go through pre-processing the data. So this, one, this is once again, once you already have your sequencing counts of different bacteria, and you take in your sequencing counts, you remove bacterial taxa that have low coverage across samples, you scale everything to one, so take relative abundances, and then you perform principal component analysis to display your samples in this multi-dimensional space. And then the next step, is to uh, go through actually finding a random set of bacterial taxa. So you first check, is my current set random, which would be the set of all taxa included? And if the answer is no, you remove taxa whose relative abundances correlate with P the PC1 values from that original PCA plot. And then you rescale all the totals to one of what, whatever taxa are remaining. You check again, is this set random? If not, you keep going. And if yes, you take that random set and you normalize the DC, you can output your normalized table. Uh, looming question, how do you detect when a set of taxa is random? So to do that, what, what I've felt is that you would use a correlation-based principal coordinate analysis to plot all your bacterial taxa in this multi-dimensional space, shown here, like each dot is a taxa, and the distances between them represent correlation. So when taxa are far away in the plot, they're highly negatively correlated. So if there's a large correlation structure in your data, it means it's not random, and so you get lots of spread in these plots. Whereas if you take only the random taxa over here, randomly distributed across samples, you get a much more even spread of your, of your taxa. And also the variance explained in, in PC1 and PC2 is much lower. So that's how you detect. And you do this by comparing against uh, a random chance statistical model to see if it's actually random. Now we go through an actual example. So this is a simulated 16S data set. 
on the left here. That's the original, that's the true population. And so in this data set, a very large portion of taxa shown in red and warmer colors have been inflated in a second set of samples. And then another set, and so that's 40% of them that have been inflated, and 10% of the taxa have been deflated, those are shown in blue, and the rest of the 50% shown in green are all randomly distributed across the samples. And most, there's 5,000 taxa there, most of them are grouped into this gray other category, that's why you can't see them, because they're at very low abundance. And so the importance about this data set is it violates the balanced differential abundance assumption of these uh, normalization tools. And so now going through how this algorithm actually works, we don't have this original community counts. What we have is a sequencing data. And so we filter it out. So we have only high coverage taxa. That's what I've already done here. Take the relative lenses, perform PCA. So then there's our samples plotted in the PCA space. And then we move into the stage of finding a random taxa set. So we do this correlation-based PCOA analysis. And so in here, the inflated taxa that have increased in the second set of samples are red in this plot, and the ones that have been artificially decreased are blue, and the ones that are random are black. And because you still have a lot of spread in this plot, you say that it's, it's not random, there's still correlation there. So you remove the taxa that correlate with PC, the PC1 values from that original PCA plot on the bottom left. And once you've done that, you rescale everything to one, put them all back into this correlation space, and then you check again to see if there's a major correlation structure there. You see that there's still some spread in the data, so you remove again, and then you rescale everything to one, and then, and then, so then you check again, and there's still a bit of spread. So then you do one more time, you remove, once you've rescaled everything to one, you remove the set of taxa that correlate with PC1, and then here's what you're left with, and you can see that now there's even distribution in this space, and also the PC1 and PC2 variance explained values are very low, and using that I statistically quantify, like, comparing against a test score that, that isn't that random. Take that random set and normalize the DSeq. <coughs> so now looking into actual performance of how RCM works compared to DSeq. Once again, this is our original data set where 40% of the taxa have been inflated, 10% deflated, and 50% of them are random. So the balanced differential abundance assumption is violated here because 40%, a much higher amount of them have been inflated than the one that have been deflated. Um, and so we don't know that. What we have is these sequencing counts. And so when you perform DC2 on these sequencing counts, this is the normalized result that you get. And you see it's performing OK, but not super great. It's a bit off. Whereas if you use RCM, this is the result you get. And you can see that this much more is much, this result is a lot more similar to the original absolute count. And so that's the whole goal of normalization is to get values that approximate the absolute count. So then doing follow-up statistical analysis on this normalized data, what I've found is that using only RCM controls uh, false positive rates when doing differential expression to detect differentially abundant taxa in these two artificial experimental groups. And all the other methods have inflated false positive rates, including DC, EDGEAR, and comma Adelex2. Okay, so this is great news, which is pretty much like, once, I, once again, that was a data set where the balanced differential abundance assumption was violated. And so, the solution that I've come up with, there is no balanced differential abundance assumption. It works great in these data sets where no other methods do. However, this method still currently only works when at least 50% of your vectoral taxa are random across samples. And I'm currently working on a version that works when 10% of your vectoral taxa, or components to be more general for sequencing, are random. And so, uh, and the other thing is that this method is not just applicable to bacterial abundances determined by 16F sequencing. It's applicable to any kind of abundances that are determined by sequencing. So metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, and uh, also just RNA-seq for any kind of experiment. So my final phase is going to be evaluate the performance of this normalization method on all these different other kinds of data sets. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, my supervisor, Dr. John Parkinson, the members of my thesis committee, uh, David Gutman and Tim Hughes, and uh, the Parkinson Lab and all the funding agencies and